Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Live at Five tour with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. I am your curator, Kevin Adkison, and today I am broadcasting from the lower level of Cranbrook Art Museum and the Cranbrook Archives Reading Room. So Next week on Tuesday, I will be delivering my fourth Uncovering Cranbrook Lecture series, uh, and this will be Uncovering the Cranbrook Connections of Aero Saarinen and Yale University. I myself am a graduate of Yale, and I lived in Aero Saarinen's buildings there, so it's a special topic for me to talk about. And before we uh, have that lecture next Tuesday, I thought it would be interesting today for us to go through some of the holdings of Cranbrook archives that are related to America's great mid-century modern master, Aero Saarinen. Now, Aero Saarinen was the uh, son of Aliel and Loya Saarinen. Aliel was Cranbrook's architect. He was also the first president of Cranbrook Academy of Art, and he built the Cranbrook institutions from 1925 until the art museum finished in 1942. Loya Saarinen, of course, led the weaving studio. They had two children, their daughter Pipson, who I'll focus on in an upcoming Live at Five, and then their younger son, Aero Saarinen. He was 13 when they immigrated from Finland to Chicago. He was 15 when he uh, came to Bloomfield Hills. And uh, he went to public high school in part because his father was designing and building Cranbrook School. So Arrow could not have gone to high school here at Cranbrook. So he went to public schools in Birmingham. Uh, he always felt a little bit out of place because he had a thick Finnish accent. He did not understand American culture. And he also thought that he was just wildly more talented than his classmates, which was probably true. So today, uh, in preparation for the tour, or for the lecture next week, uh, I've pulled out a number of drawings from Cranbrook archives from Aero Saarinen's really his teenage years up through his early career in the early 1950s. Now, tragically, he only practiced architecture for 11 years between his father's death in 1950 and his own untimely death at 51 in 1961 uh, of a uh, brain uh, tumor. So today we are going to look at these drawings and I'll just add that the drawings we have here at Cranbrook Archives um, include drawings for Cranbrook. They include some of Arrow's Yale student work. They include some drawings um, as well as building projects. But this is not the full archive of Aero Saarinen and Associates. Um, those records are at Yale University. Uh, they went to Yale in two batches, and so the first big gift to Yale was from Aileen Lusheim Saarinen, the second Mrs. Saarinen. Uh, she gave Yale a number of Aileel Saarinen drawings as well as Aero Saarinen letters and notes, uh, both to the Smithsonian Muse uh, uh, Archives of American Art and also to Yale in the 90s. And then starting about 2002, uh, Kevin Roach and John Dinkaloo gave the bulk of the Aero Saarinen archive to Yale. And so what we have here, um, each of these drawings has a unique story as to why it's here in Bloomfield Hills and not out at Yale. Uh, but I do think in not having acres and acres of drawings from Aero Saarinen, um, I, th I think that these are even more special and, and probably e get even more use than what is back in New Haven. So let's get started. And the first thing that I've pulled out is one of the first things that Aero Saarinen designs for his father's campus here at Cranbrook. These are little um, grotesques. So I featured these in a few Live at Fives now. Uh, and if you walk around Cranbrook's campus, you know that these are over on Page Hall, the uh, historic boys' school campus study hall. It's still the, the study hall for the boys' dormitory. And Aliel was the architect of the overall building, but he challenged his 19-year-old son, why don't you design some of the architectural ornament? And so 
if we look down at the block for this, the information block for this architectural drawing, we see that it's coming out of the Cranbrook Architectural Office in Bloomfield Hills, Dormitory Edition, edition 2.3 and 4, also known as Page Hall. And then it says, Architect Aliel Saarinen, drawn by Aero Saarinen. And a lot of these records, they would just say drawn by and then three initials, and that might be a young draftsman working in the office or an associate architect who has drafted it. But here it is the son, uh, and so this is Arrow's own hand. And you can see that he's used a number of materials. So he's used graphite, and then he's also used um, uh, maybe a Conte crayon or a sort of brown pencil. Uh, very much the same type of materials that he was using to draw do life studies and nudes, but also to draw architectural scenes. And so he's really treating this functional um, construction document as a work of art. And so you can see that he has designed the way the face is going to look, but then he also has to show the mason how to actually carve it. And so this is the profile of this face. So it comes out to his cheek and then his mouth, uh, nose sort of sticks out. And so this is a, is this one-to-one? -one? It may be half scale. No, this is full scale. So this is one-to-one. -one. So this is how exactly large the mason is going to carve each one of these faces. Now, I mentioned that Arrow wasn't particularly happy uh, at high school in uh, downtown Birmingham. And so uh, he goes from high school and he had won a national soap carving competition uh, and his bar of soap was eventually turned into a bronze cast. Uh, that got him acclaim both at high school but also attention sort of across the country. And he thought that he would follow in his mother's footstep and become a sculptor. And so just as Loya Saarinen had headed off to France in 1902 to study sculpture in Paris, Aero went in 1929 and studied for eight months sculpture, but he never really lost this sort of nagging feeling that he was meant to be an architect. And so he comes back to Bloomfield Hills and his father writes to the Yale School of Fine Arts, to the dean of the school, and says, we would uh, my boy would like to go to Yale as a special student. And Dean Meeks writes back, we would love to have your boy. Aliel Saarinen was one of America's most famous architects. Of course, they were going to have his precocious son. Arrow enrolls as a special student, but he does become a, 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 a degree student, and he does the four-year program in three years, earning his uh, BFA in architecture in 1934. And so the next drawing that I've pulled out is one of my favorite things at Cranbrook, and this is a student drawing of Aero Saarinen. And if you don't uh, read architectural blueprints, that's okay. I'm gonna walk us through uh, this drawing. It's first of all, huge, um, which is pretty standard for student drawings of the day. And Yale was part of a system of schools, uh, a methodology as well as an organization called the Beaux-Arts Institute of America. It was modeled after the Beaux-Arts Academy in France, in Paris, which was the historic centuries-old architecture school. Uh, we sometimes call the sort of wave of neoclassical architecture in the 19-teens and 20s, the Beaux-Arts style. So think of the Detroit Institute of Art and the Detroit Public Library. Those are pretty much textbooks examples of Beaux-Arts style architecture. It not only was a style, it was also a way of teaching. And so Arrow would have been assigned this project, a residence for a college dean, not as a sort of studio project where whoever his instructor was just came out with this idea out of thin air. It would have been all the Beaux-Arts Institute schools, um, so Yale, MIT, Georgia Tech, um, uh, you know, most of the major architecture programs were part of the Beaux-Arts Institute, even Michigan at a time. They all would have been doing this same challenge. And the first part would have been called the Eski Eski, the sketch. And so the student would have had one, two, four hours to do a answer to the problem. So a residence of a college dean, here is my sketch. This is what it's going to look like. Then they would come back the next day and they would have eight, 12, 
24 hours to produce the presentation drawing. Then they would send the drawings off, all of the students would submit them to the New York offices, and they would get written critiques from the architects at the Beaux-Arts Institute. So there was no sort of sitting around talking about the work as architecture schools do now. It was a fully sort of um, very standardized, very centralized way of learning architecture very far away from what Eliel Saarinen was doing here at Cranbrook. His first architecture student arrives in 1931. And I think, you know, why did Eliel send his son off to this very conservative architecture school when he was founding this very revolutionary architecture school here um, and the Bauhaus was still open? There's no reason Arrow couldn't have gone there. I think it was something about the Saarinens wanting their son to become Americanized. And so uh, going to Yale was a uh, a career boon, but also it leads to Arrow's citizenship as a U.S. citizen, and it leads to his work for the government. And it really does, I think, launch him as an American architect, his time at Yale. But let's now look at the drawing after I've given you enough history, which you'll hear again in more detail with more illustrations next week at the lecture. Um, so the college dean's house, you pull into this forecourt, and the cars can go back to the service court in the garage. Or if you're the students or the faculty coming to an event at the dean's house, you walk in and you see that Arrow has designed all the way down to the rugs in the room. And then on the north-south axis, you see the stairway up to the second floor bedrooms here. And then the dining room arranged up to a breakfast room and uh, then the staff quarters and kitchens over here. Then entering into the living room slightly asymmetrical, uh, we see the living room leads into a private study for the dean and then a library back here. And what strikes me about this drawing, which is from 1931, uh, is how similar it is to Saarinen House here at Cranbrook. Uh, and that includes the details like the floor plan and the way at Saarinen House, the way that Aliel Saarinen brings you into a vestibule, runs you sideways into a living room, and then symmetrical down to the uh, dining room. And then again, a studio that is arranged on a symmetrical axis, but you enter it asymmetrically. And then even the way that Aliel Saarinen lights the living room using these torchères, these lamps that shine lights up, well, let's go to the section cut of the college dean's residence. And what do we see there? But young Arrow is proposing torchères, shooting light up to the ceiling and reflecting it back down. He also has little details like this vestibule for the library where you have a hanging lamp reflecting into a shallow dome, which is a design motif that occurs in probably a half dozen spaces here at Cranbrook, where Aliel suspends a closed lamp shooting the light into a shallow dome. Even on the second floor, you can see that Arrow in this hall of doors has a very typical detail of his father's of doing these stepped recessed lights. But then he also pulls from his sister this idea that the doors would all have some sort of charming little painting on them, which is exactly what the Coble House in Gross Point, Saarinen House here at Cranbrook, or the dormitories even at Kingswood, they all have this little pattern. And then if we look at even the outside of the Dean's House, you see this telescoping ziggurat form, uh, which very much is coming from Kingswood, which is being uh, completed the same time, the same year that Arrow is designing a residence for a college dean. Now, in the Beaux-Arts style, they told you exactly how to lay out your drawing and exactly which parts of the drawing you needed to have. So he has the section cut here. He has a little um, rendering of the project here. The floor plan takes pride of place. And then at the top, we see the elevation or what the building looks like from the front. Now, this is very much against his father's own beliefs in architecture. Aliel Saarinen said that the plan and section were useless because they don't describe how you experience space. So Aliel always represented his buildings through models, watercolors, or perspective drawings. So it is interesting that Arrow is being forced to use a rendering technique that he knows his father doesn't think conveys architectural principles. 
I love the way that the facade has these highlights in blue and red. And when we come down past the stairway, past the auto court, uh, we come down to this little group of students who sort of blend into the overall design of the bushes and the sort of environment, the trees and things. Uh, but you see the students with their blue and red noses and their mortar boards. And that first student there is uh, sipping champagne out of a champagne glass. It's a pretty fabulous drawing here in Cranbrook Archives. And again, if you're just joining me, I'm the curator, Kevin Atkinson, and we are having a live tour of Cranbrook Archives Reading Room, looking at some of the drawings and treasures of Aero Saarinen that are here in Cranbrook Archives. So we talked about his designs for early on at Cranbrook School for Boys. We talked about his student years at Yale. He gets a, a very prestigious Yale travel fellowship that's still going on. He travels around North Africa and Europe sketching. He works for a brief time in Finland, and then he comes back to work for his father. He spends the war years working in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the government. And then he comes back and he's very anxious to sort of get out from under his father, even though he is in partnership with his father. So it's Saarinen and Saarinen, uh, Saarinen, Swanson, Saarinen, a number of different firms between father, son, son-in-law, and daughter. But he really gets independence in 1948 when he and his father both design competition entries for the Jefferson Expansion National Memorial Park in St. Louis. Aliel Saarinen as, is announced as one of the finalists uh, when a telegram is rushed to Bloomfield Hills saying, in fact, we got it wrong. It was not Aliel Saarinen, it was the other E Saarinen. It was this design that won. And so the Gateway Arch, which takes from 1947 when Aero designs it, all the way to 1964 when it's dedicated, uh, three years after his death, it is the great sort of futuristic uh, modernist monument, this huge abstraction on the banks of the Mississippi. These two drawings are done by Henderson Barr, who is one of four or, or five members of the competition team. Aero Saarinen was the lead designer. Dan Kiley was the landscape designer. Uh, Barr was the associate designer. Alexander Girard was in the team, and Lily Swan Sarnin was the sculptor. And so these are drawings in Barr's own hands. Uh, Arrow's drawings of the arches, arch are all at Yale. You'll see in these drawings that the arch is actually in the earliest entry. It was a two-part competition. So in the September 47 design, uh, it is a trapezoid. And so you see that inside edge of the arch is flat. And then it uh, sort of subtly uh, expands so that outside edge is wider than the inside edge, but it's still a trapezoid. At a dinner with Carl Millis, Millis suggests that the arch, in fact, needs to be a triangle. And so in the final submission in February of 48, when Arrow uh, wins the competition with a unanimous jury after one vote, uh, he submitted the design for a triangular arch, which is, of course, what would be built in stainless steel and concrete. Coming up next, so this sort of launches his career independent of his father. After his father's death, he takes over one of his father and brother-in-law's great commissions, and he redesigns the General Motors Technical Center. So this is a sketch in Arrow's own hand uh, from probably about 1950 or, or really 1949. Um, so right after the arch and he has done it in a black charcoal and in a white pastel or charcoal. And you see the sort of basic layout of the General Motors Technical Center. So where the cars are designed and engineered. And Aero proposed what would become known as the uh, corporate Cranbrook and so he proposes in the center of the campus an enormous lake with the administration building built in the center of the lake. The styling or design dome would be here where the shark cars are uh, uh, displayed. The design center runs across the, the edge of the lake and then sort of mechanical workshops, the wind tunnels, all of the chrome plating, all of the experimental laboratories are around it. Now, a lot of times, 
Eero Saarinen would do a sketch like this, but he was leading a team of some 50 people. And so after he would come up with the ideas with the team, they would work and perfect it. And people like uh, Glenn Paulson would come in and they would do subsequent designs. So this you see the design has been refined somewhat. We still have the administration building in the lake, which was not ever built, um, or it, it, the design changed. Uh, and then we still see the dome, the styling building, and then of course the famous aluminum water tower, or stainless steel water tower, rather. And this did eventually become a cover for Architectural Forum. Glenn Paulson was a uh, Wisconsin, Spooner, Wisconsin born architect who uh, studied at the uh, University of Wisconsin and then served in the US Army Air Force under Marshall Fredericks. Fredericks was, of course, Cranbrook's uh, great sculptor and sculptor instructor, and he learned that this young uh, man in his uh, regiment wanted to be an architect, and he said, you've got to go study with Aelio Saarinen. Paulson visited. He did not study here. He went to the University of Pennsylvania and the Royal Academy in Stockholm, and then he came back to work for Aelio Saarinen. He worked briefly in New York for Florence Knoll, and then he came back and he worked for Aero Saarinen from the mid-50s, uh, until 1959 or thereabouts. And the next set of drawings we'll see are all by Glenn Paulson for Aero Saarinen. We have Paulson's archives here at Cranbrook Archives because he became instructor in the Department of Architecture and then president of Cranbrook Academy of Art from 66 to 70. His archives are one of my favorite because this man could draw. His teenage drawings, his travel drawings, he was a master artisan. And I think that's why Eero Saarinen was so attracted to Paulson as an architect. He had a great eye for design, but he was also just such a wonderful communicator of buildings for the client and for studying uh, uh, refining building designs. So this is another project from the late 40s, another project like the GM Tech Center that started with father and son and would be completed by the son alone. So from 48 until uh, the early 50s, Eero Saarinen was working on Brandeis University, uh, the first non-sectarian Jewish university in the country. Um, and here we see another original sketch by Eero Saarinen showing again the organization of the campus as these sort of blocks within the landscape of buildings, of residence halls, bodies of water. And then they would be refined by people like Paulson. And so I love the uh, faculty housing drawing here, this facade of colored pencil and trees uh, in the way that the different faculty living rooms and then upstairs bedrooms are reflected. Uh, it's sort of like a, a much more joyous Mies van der Rohe. If you think of Lafayette Gardens in downtown Detroit where it's all just glass sort of condominiums. Here that you see the wooden walls, you see each faculty would have a different colored door, and then they have sort of different materials across the whole facade. And I think Eero Saarinen's modernism is a more joyful modernism, and he never loses that sort of sculptural quality that he got from his parents, or the material richness of his father's architecture, like at Cranbrook. Here is another Glenn Paulson drawing of the same faculty housing. Of, of dozens of buildings that were designed, only seven were built. And then one of my favorite drawings in archives is this room for the faculty housing apartment. So we've seen the outside, and then you would come in to these two-story apartments. Again, it's a drawing by Glenn Paulson, and he's incorporated uh, all of this wonderful modern furniture. You see the plywood chairs, you see a um, I think that may be a Ralph Rapson chair. Maybe it's supposed to be a womb chair, unclear to me. Um, but you can, I think, really picture this sort of chic, new way of being a university. No more is the dormitory room going to be kind of cloistered off as a monastery, uh, but it's now this very modern interior. And I love Paulson's use of color, uh, from the one white wall to the bright yellow doors to then the carpet. And it really shows the influence of the Cranbrook way of thinking about uh, design, that Cranbrook 
Eliel Saarinen teaches that you design from the next smallest to the next largest thing. And so though they are just the architects, they have designed this building thinking about what is going inside. So they think about what is the type of rug that will be there, what type of furniture, what type of things will sit on the shelves. And they really breathe life into the space in thinking about it as this total modernist environment. I really hope the, the camera is doing justice to these drawings as we look at them. I just have a couple more pulled out for us to look at, and then I'll uh, leave you with some concluding thoughts. Uh, this is another Glenn Paulson drawing. And so uh, if you're wondering why so many are Glenn Paulson drawings, well, Paulson's archives are here at Cranbrook. And so these are pieces that he took from the firm. Uh, and so they are Aero Sarnen and Associates drawings, but they are ones that Paulson uh, held on to. So this is a school down in Fort Wayne, Indiana, Concordia University, which was uh, part of the Lutheran Church's expansion of senior colleges throughout the country. And so the Fort Wayne Concordia was designed by Aero Saarinen, and it was designed to be built out of these very funny bricks that you can see them hinted at in the cross hatching. And the bricks were all uh, diamond shaped, at 23.5 degree angles. And that is the angle of the Earth's axis to the sun. And so the entire campus has some serious sort of st Stonehenge moments during the equinox. Um, and everything, all of these diamond shaped bricks would be laid on the horizontal for all of the buildings, except for the chapel, when the diamond brick is then laid on its vertical uh, length. And so it becomes the same 23.5 degree angle, but uh, makes this sort of peaked roof for the chapel. Now, Arrow envisioned that this campus would look like a Northern European village or like a Swiss um, village. I have visited, it sort of comes across more as a mid-century kind of nicely detailed motel. Um, it, it, it was not a project that Aero ended up being particularly happy with through budget cuts and changes to the designs, artworks that he thought were really integral that were never executed. Um, it is amazing to go and visit. If you're in Fort Wayne, the Dan Kiley landscape and just the sort of cohesion of the whole campus because they have always only built in these 23.5 degree bricks. It really is a special place to visit um, though I'm not sure that it, it, it lived up to Arrow's own aims. The entire campus is also clad in roof tiles made by the Ludoichi Tile Company uh, in Ohio, which is the same tile company that made the 1908 roofs of Cranbrook House. So from this cool drawing of the Concordia Senior College, we will end on this drawing by Claude de Forest. And Claude de Forest was a Swiss architect. His father and uncle were architects. Uh, he immigrated in 1949 to Montreal. He studied at McGill uh, and then at Manitoba University in architecture or in engineering. And then uh, he was class of 1956 at MIT. Upon graduation from with his architecture degree at MIT, he moved here to Bloomfield Hills. Uh, where he worked for Aero Saarinen and Associates for just two years, 1956 to 58. He then moved back to Switzerland where he lived the rest of his life as an architect. But in the two years that he was here, he was really integral to Aero Saarinen and Associates. He was a cartoonist, but he was also an architectural designer and renderer. And so though he worked on many different projects um, from IBM to TWA to UPenn to Chicago Law. Uh, my favorite piece that we have is this cartoon of Aero Saarinen's office. And so this is a little building over on Long Lake Road. It's still there, it's a law firm. Uh, it was designed by Aero and Glenn Paulson. And you entered into the building on the second floor. It's built on a hill. And so we come in and we see all of the sort of uh, secretarial pool, pool here. Uh, we see Mr. Bond, who is sweeping up the heads of architects who have uh, left 
someone displeased. And Arrow was known a bit for his temper, but he was also just known for his megalomania uh, working habits. He was always in the office. He once called his uh, assistant on Christmas morning and said, where is everyone? And the assistant said, it's Christmas. And he said, my family have finished opening our presents. Why is no one at the office? Um, so he's sort of tucked away here at the corner with his pipes and his glasses and all of the glue of the models. And it looks like he's uh, sculpting a pumpkin into a building here. And then down in the front, we see Joe Lacey, the office manager, who is keeping an eye on the street, seeing who is coming to and fro. Uh, we see the accountant with a card greeting from Oslo. And then John Dinkaloo, um, who was the uh, sort of engineering and management side of the office, who is overwhelmed in thought here. And then we have all of the workers who are in various states of pleasure and duress, um, moving across the campus. Don Pettit oh, eating some bones there at the top. And then uh, here, Vassar was one of the projects on the board, and Vassar uh, was a huge set of semicircular dormitories. Only one was built, but it was going to just be this absolutely massive circular dormitory. And so you can see that they're drawing the semicircle on the blueprint for the Vassar building. TWA, the airport terminal, he's building the little model airplane. And then we can go downstairs to the lower level. And the firm was famous for um, uh, its workshop and model shop. So Aero demanded that all the buildings be built full or, or at these huge scales so he could get his whole head into the model. And again, his father's belief that you designed a building not through plan and section, but through experience, models, and perspectives. And so you have the model shop here uh, taking a drink out of a a uh, tulip chair, cutting his toenails with a saw. Um, let's see. The junior architects, I think the building is leaking. He has his umbrella. It's kind of an amazing uh, artifact of the culture of the office. Cesar Pelli here is playing the violin and he has his horns, the great Argentine American architect. And then Jill Mitchell, the wife of Cranbrook's president, Wally Mitchell. So this is just a, a fun artifact. Um, I hope you maybe saw some names on there that you recognized. Um, so this, these are the pieces that I pulled. There are, of course, more drawings, but these are just some of my favorites that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, and just to give you a little taste about next Tuesday's Uncovering Cranbrook lecture series. Tickets are still on sale. We'll sell them up to about two hours before the lecture, but why don't you head over to center.cranbrook.edu and buy your tickets now. It'll be $20 at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern time. Same lecture. And I'm going to focus on Eero Saarinen going to Yale, what he studied at Yale, the projects he did, but then also his return to Yale as campus master planner. Now, we don't have any of his Yale-related materials here at Cranbrook Archives, so thank you to Yale Manuscripts and Archives for their extensive digitizing and public domain uh, 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 records, because you can search tens of thousands of drawings and photographs of Arrow's papers there. Um, but We'll talk about Arrow's return to New Haven to be the university master planner in 19, um, uh, the early 1950s. And then we'll talk about his designs for college uh, hockey's greatest arena, the Great Yale Whale, which is this sort of suspended uh, wood, steel, and concrete structure. And then we'll also talk about his designs for two residential colleges, uh, which I lived here in Morse College for uh, four years. In fact, my room was actually my junior year. It was this room. And then my senior year, I lived in the former elevator override that had been converted into a dorm room. The best views in all of New Haven. So I hope if you enjoyed today's little uh, peek into some of the 
primary source documents related to Aero Saarinen and Associates uh, and Aero Saarinen's time as a student, uh, as a young designer, and as a uh, helm at the helm of one of America's greatest mid-century architecture firms that you will consider heading over to center.cranbrook.edu and purchasing your ticket. Um, if you are coming to me from the future and you're watching this live at five later, uh, you can actually email center.cranbrook.edu, uh, center at cranbrook.edu, and buy a ticket to the recording. So we will record the lecture and it will be available for viewing after. Um, why are we doing paid tickets? You know, this is a question that I get sometime. Uh, your support, your Tickets are what keep the Center for Collections and Research in operation. So uh, during this pandemic, we, have, we did not have a tour season until September, and now it's a much truncated and smaller tour. And so our income comes from your support. We're a bit like PBS, our NPR. Uh, and so uh, we are here to tell the Cranbrook story, to maintain the Cranbrook archives, and to uh, further the understanding and renown of Cranbrook's uh, scientists, artists, educators, and, and all of the families uh, and designers who have come out of Cranbrook. The mission of the Center for Collections and Research is to share those stories. And so uh, I love doing these free Live at Five tours. It has been the highlight of my year. Uh, but by coming to the paid lectures and the paid event events, you are helping us to um, be able to survive and survive and thrive during this time of global pandemic and no tourism. So I hope that uh, you know that your, your $20 ticket price is not just um, going to, to nothing. It is what uh, makes the work of the center and the staff of the center. It is what keeps us in business and makes our uh, mission to tell the Cranbrook story possible. So with that, little sales pitch out of the way. I hope that everyone has had a chance to get out and enjoy the fall weather. If you're here in the Pleasant Peninsula or wherever you are, I hope that you are having as resplendent of a fall as we are here. Um, the campus is open and so it looks like we have another weekend or two of beautiful leaves, even if we're sort of post peak leaf. Um, the oaks are still changing and the campus is still beautiful. I took an hour walk just last night and it is spectacular even in the rain. I kind of uh, appreciate walking in the rain because then it's just me and my thoughts. And I see one question from Sally about looking at the faculty way housing. I hope you saw last week's Live at Five where we did an interior tour of Iris Eichenberg's uh, house on faculty way. Um, but I think it is a, it's a, a aspect of Cranbrook that does need more research. Um, those little buildings from 1938 are kind of totally forgotten because they're covered in vines and then a row of trees and then another row of trees. You never even notice them. So there is always more to learn about Cranbrook and always more to talk about. Um, and once we start getting into these file cabinets and the tens of thousands of objects in Cranbrook archives, there are even more stories. So keep, keep on coming back. I'll be back next Wednesday for another Live at Five. On Tuesday is the Aero Saarinen and Yale University Uncovering Cranbrook Lecture. Uh, and then if you're signed up for our weekly blog, you'll get that on Friday. And make sure you're signed up for our email list as well. You can sign up for that on our email website. Uh, and that way you will be in touch with Big, big plans for Cranbrook archives because what's in this room is just a quarter of our collection and we are revving up to hopefully uh, expand and improve Cranbrook archives so we can expand and improve our reach to students, scholars, visitors, interested public because there are some real treasures in here. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a wonderful day. Be safe, wear a mask, and I'll see you next week.